simple ways to figure out the perfect diet for your genes. Joining us is Kerry Glassman, a registered dietitian, and back again is Dr. David Katz. So Kerry, how easy is it to figure out what your diet DNA is without actually getting the, the swab and the testing done? Well, there's a few things you can look at. Clinical signs, so your blood work that you'll get from your MD. Physical signs, where you're carrying your weight. And then also, just how you feel, symptoms. How do you feel after you eat certain foods? Do you have gastric distress? All right, so we're going to actually do this right now. You guys interested? Yeah. Right. Gabriella, why don't you start with you? Come on up here. So we, we, we got some quiz questions for you. And based on these quiz questions, we're going to predict your diet DNA, okay? okay. So look at the screen right over here. Okay. So first question is, does heart disease run your family? Do you have low energy levels often? And you have high amounts of the lousy bad LDL cholesterol. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, yes. so we would predict that you'd be on a low-fat diet for the best success losing the weight. And Carrie, explain to us a little bit about the indicators and how they predict low-fat diets. Well, first of all, if heart disease runs in your family, that's obviously, that's an uncontrollable risk factor. So there's nothing we can do about that. What you can control, obviously, is your diet. So you want to control what you can. So being on a low-fat diet will obviously help prevent heart disease. Okay. What when, if you already have it? Well, you can all, we can also we can reverse that as well. Okay. Low energy levels. What happens is many people that have low energy levels that should be on a low-fat diet are eating a lot of not only fat but bad types of fats that are actually making you feel incredibly lethargic. Hmm. Also, refined sugars. Sugars, refined carbohydrates will also make you feel lethargic. So you don't want to waste any calories. You want to make sure that what the low-fat carbohydrates that you do eat will provide you with the best energy whole grains such as quinoa, legumes such as black beans. Hmm. And then those high LDL levels, we know that a low fat diet does not mean no fat. You still are going to have a certain amount of fat in your diet. Again, you don't want to waste any calories. You want to make sure that you maximize the fat that you're consuming and you eat good fats, monounsaturated fats from avocado and olive oil that are going to help improve your HDL, good cholesterol, and get that number above 50. While lowering that lousy number. Makes well, sense? Yep. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Got our next test up here. Let's look at this one. Roberta, where's Roberta? Come on up, Roberta. All right. So now, guess what? We got the questions that we think people who should be on a low carbohydrate diet should be on. Here are the questions. Carry weight around the midsection. Well, yes, I would say so. All right. We'll give you a pass on that. High blood pressure. Yes. You do. And triglyceride levels that are high. Yes, unfortunately. So for all three of those? Yes. And so according to this test, it would predict that a low-carb diet would be in your best interest. Carrie, explain that, please. If you carry weight around your midsection, so if your waist is greater than 35 inches, you are at risk for heart disease, gallbladder disease, diabetes, <clears throat> and you also may be insulin resistant. So that's why a low-carb diet may be better for you. Also, if you have high blood pressure, if you lose weight, 10% of your body weight, you can lower your blood pressure. Now you can do that if you lower your, if you lose 10% of your body weight, regardless of what type of diet, you're going to lose, you're going to lower your blood pressure. However, if you also are carrying the weight around the midsection, so if you're that apple body shape, you may be at even greater risk for heart disease and uh, gallbladder disease and diabetes. Yes. Also, those high triglyceride levels, meaning if you have triglycerides, that's a fat, you know, in your body. Mm -hmm. If that's above 150, in conjunction with all these other factors, you are going to also at greater risk. So, David, talk to us about insulin resistance, that, that whole syndrome that's sort of pointed to here. Exactly. And these right. low-carb diets. Yeah, in fact, all three of these features are part of the insulin resistance syndrome. And, in fact, we can talk more specifically about weight around the middle. Women, it, you can wrap a, a tape measure uh, around your waist, about the level of your belly button. If it's 34 inches or above, you're at increased risk for insulin resistance. And what you want to do then is bring down the glycemic load of your diet. One way to do that is to bring down carbohydrate. And in particular, you really want to avoid the refined starches and the simple sugars. And a critical theme running through all of this, whether you're cutting fat or cutting carbs, is the foods you concentrate on are wholesome foods. And so you know, not all carbohydrate is created equal. Lentils and lollipops are both carbohydrate. They're very different <laughs> foods, right? But you bring down the glycemic load of your diet by bringing down, in particular, those carbohydrates that are not your friend. It will help mobilize fat yeah, from around the middle. It will lower your blood pressure, help bring your HDL up, help bring your triglycerides down. This yeah, is the insulin yeah. resistance syndrome. It I can be reversed by lifestyle. Really, yeah. That sounds good. Makes sense, Roberta? Yes, it does. Thank you very yeah. much. And you're very <laughs> handsome. <laughs>
So we covered low fat, we covered low carbohydrate. So guess what's left? We're going to talk about who's best suited for a balanced diet. Here are the key questions. This is an important group. You have a history of diabetes and heart disease in the family? Yes. You do. Mediterranean ethnicity? Yes, Italian. Italian origin, all yes. right. And prone to indigestion or constipation? Indigestion. Indigestion. Yes. All right. So you meet all those characteristics. Yes, I do. So, David, if it's good enough for my grandparents, it's good enough for me, it's probably true for all of you as well. These issues of ethnicity get forgotten oftentimes. Explain you, them. You know, that's really the power of nutrigenomics, ma'am, that it reminds us of the importance of heritage and the kinds of foods that our mothers and fathers and grandparents and generations before them were eating become really the kinds of foods that our tribe adapted to. And there are some very important variations in different ethnic groups. For example, by and large, Scandinavians do very well consuming dairy because they are all lactose tolerant. Right. For the most part, Native Americans, Chinese, are lactose intolerant. It's a genetic difference. But the ethnic difference really explains it because of the different history of exposure to dairying. Same thing for many other foods. So folks from the Mediterranean region, not terribly shocking that a Mediterranean diet might work very well and provides all the comforts of home into the bargain. So one more time, the whole idea of, of your, uh, your diet DNA is that we can help understand what diets will make it easiest for us to stay on them. That's the basic takeaway message. You can pick the smart foods from the many that we talked about today. Jimmy, thank you very, very much. Carrie, as well. Dr. Catherine, it's a pleasure. We'll be right back.